Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hello there, it's Dr. Gemma, and this is episode 164 of the Cognitive Podcast. I'm here recording this on Tuesday night, January 9th, because I made an absolute muck-up of it when I tried to record it last night. So we're going to try again. In the warm thanks department, I wanted to thank Schmevelin, who put up the meme that I was happy to include here. It is a quote by the British poet, really the English poet, T.S. Eliot, and it runs like this. For last year's words belong to last year's language. And next year's words await another voice. I love that. I think it's really great. The thank you, Schmevelin. Really marvelous. There is also a picture in the show notes of what I call the glorious three dozen. That is the candles that I made. I forgot to mention these, I believe, in episode 163. So here they are showing up in 164. And I will talk about that in the blather. The short answer, you should not be afraid to make your own candles. It's easy and it's fun. You should also know if you make your own candles, you only have to do it once every few years. I think the last time I did it was probably in the spring of 2018. Because if you make 36 candles, unless you're really crazy about burning candles all the time, night and day, they're going to take a while to use up. So there's some good news about that. We'll talk about a little bit of candle craft at the end here. In the meantime... I'm talking about looking at the pictures in the show notes. And of course, the show notes are on our group on Ravelry. And there's a link to that at the very top of the show notes, in fact. So if you're on the blog, you can go to the Ravelry group. And the show notes are also at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com, all one word, with the K in cognitive to form the word knit. In the meantime, the other warm thanks here go to our own Sal Pal. I'd say that these are more like warm hugs. Because Sal Pal, like me, had quite the Romeo, but mine was mostly over by Christmas, the worst of it. And then things were just fun. Sal Pal, on the other hand, she had a pretty rock and roll time. So warm hugs out there, Sal Pal. Welcome back. It was nice to see a comment by you. In the meantime, if you are interested in Cognitive Fiber Retreat 10, that is 2024, CFR 10, all the info is right under that link that is right near the top of the show notes. I will talk about it again in the calendar and give some more information. Why do I put that link at the top? Because if you're only here for the CFR info, I want you to find it right away. That link will take you to our info thread on Ravelry. Meanwhile, let's talk about what's on my hooks and needles, shall we? Well, first off, you may remember the four sock cowls, that is sock yarn cowls, that I made at CFR 23. Because I fell in love with that pattern. It's such a good way to use up leftover sock yarn. And a lot of people were doing it with me at the fiber retreat. And the patterns and variations people were using were so magnificent. But I went for the original, which is subtitled, cram in all the color variations that you can. Now, of course, I had a ton of leftover sock yarn. And mysteriously, I handed around my bag of tradable mini skeins and came back with way more than I handed around as far as I can tell. And that's great. Because the great thing about these cows, you can just give them to people like, hey, thank you, here's a hostess gift. It's a little scarf. And it doesn't cost you anything except your time, of course. At any rate, I love these things. Like the candles, they're these sort of just hand around types of gifts. If you're at a white elephant party at work, whatever. In the picture, you can see CFR sock cow number three. And I had finished that and then realized that I didn't like it as thin as it was. 
So I added many more rows. And so there is a picture of our Minerva. She's actually quite happy. Why she's not biting or attacking me there, I can't figure out. Because I wouldn't think she'd like to be a model. However, she did. And she is lying in her beautiful way underneath the cow. So you can see the colors that got into that cow. These things are really wonderful. I have to say, if you've got a pile of leftover sock yarn, I have them all in a bag. Sometimes they're on my desk. Sometimes they're in this bag next to the desk. And I just reach in, close my eyes, and grab anything. And I will make decisions like, no, that's too much green, too close together, something like that. But I've had a really good time just doing these. And these sit next to my desk in my office because if you have a few minutes between patients and your notes are done and updated and all that, sometimes you just sit and do a quarter of a row while you're waiting for the time to pass before your patient shows up online. Like these are just really fun to have around as little mini projects that are easy to carry with you. The downside, if you try to carry all the yarn bits around with you, no, that gets annoying. But if you have them set up next to your office desk, that's pretty nice. So there is Minerva modeling the third one. The fourth one I am now working on, it's pretty close to finished. It's so oh, probably about seven-eighths, two-thirds to seven-eighths of the way done. So this is working very nicely. And what will I do? I still have leftover sock yarn. I don't have it in large enough increments to make scrappy socks, but don't worry because I've got plenty of sock yarn to go. I'm quite sable on it. So these little bits and bobs will go back into their special bag and wait for the next time I have enough accumulation, I think, to make scrappy socks. But I have to say that discovering the sock yarn cow pattern is very satisfying. And of course, there are links in the show notes that will take you through to my Ravelry page and then through to the pattern. In progress, well, the Stash Toss 2024, because I have not finished the Evolution 23 socks, we are still at zero in versus zero out for skeins. But I'm very happy about that because I know I'm on the heel of the Evolution sock. And it's the second sock. As you may know, I showed the first finished sock in a previous episode. So I'm on that heel. And when I do that, we will have zero in versus one skein out. Yay! In the meantime, I'd like to remind you, it is January 9th. And you know what that means. Yeah, Vestuary 2024 is coming. Hey, what's vestuary? I didn't make this one up, but whoever did, thank you. In the shortest month of the year, you make the smallest sweater. And so that's a vest. And I'd like to say I'm going to do something really revolutionary, but I'll be honest, I have gotten huge distance out of Ann Bud's Knitter's Handy Book of Pattern out of the vest pattern in there. And this one, same one, V-neck vest. I love V-neck vests. And I'm just going to do another. I will be doing it in Malabrigo Rios denim because I had bought four skeins to make this vest for someone else. And she kind of gracelessly backed out. And that's another story I won't be telling. <laughs> but anyway, I looked at it and said, well, denim blue. I mean, who doesn't want a vest in that? Well, I don't know, but I know one thing's for sure. I do. So I will be doing that starting February 1st. But you say, what about the Romeo sweater? Yes, I mean, what about it? What about the Evolution socks? What about that last cow? Sure. Not to mention the Pennsylvania Dutch embroidery, which I haven't touched. No problem. I'm just working on all these things in little bits and bobs. And I will put aside the Romule briefly to do the vestuary because I can do those really fast. Vestuary is meant to be sewn together and two pieces sewn together. And then you add ribbing and the, all that. Well, I don't do that. I knit it bottom up in the round until I get to the divide for the sleeves and the v-neck. And that's worked really well for me. I've made a whole bunch of these. I don't even know how many, probably five or six. And I really found the successful way to do it with Malabrigo Rios. In fact, I'm wearing, this might have been Vestuary 23 or 20, I don't know if it was 22 or 23. I think this is Vestuary 22 and it's in Rios and it's in Heaven and Earth, alias Cielo y Piedra. No, that's Heaven and Stone. Sierra, Cielo y Tierra. There we go. And it looks blue, but when you knit it up, it came out looking like a dark steel gray, which is odd because when you look at it closely, you see brown and blue. Well, that's not denim now, is it? 
but it goes very well with my darker skirts. But I want a denim blue. I mean, who doesn't want another blue sweater, really? If you're me and you have my coloring, believe me, you do. So, meantime, the Romeo sweater, there's a picture of it a few nights ago. I have taken to working on it at nights after I see my patients. It's just lovely. And I tend to do about five rows on each sleeve or five rows on the body because I'm working very carefully because I'm color blending. You can see in that picture, I think five, if not six, little skeins. And that's just to get through one row because I'm holding yarn together. And right now I'm holding hand spun together, except one of the yarns is a Noro Silk Garden that I want to get through a darker gradient because I'm using it to begin the transition to a darker brown at the bottom of the sweater. Anyway, I'm having a blast color blending, but it's slow going because you have to make sure that you have enough so that the sleeves pretty well match the body. I don't always do that. In the feral Easter egg, the sleeves match the body down to slightly below the bust line, and then the sleeves just went off in their own dark colorway because I liked the way that looked. But usually I'm knitting in three tubes at once. I'm knitting each sleeve and I'm knitting the body so that I can color coordinate. And that sounds hard, but it's not. When you first divide the sleeves, it's clumsy because I have three sets of knitting needles there, and they're all just tied together with hair bands. And so, yeah, sometimes you're getting one set of knitting needles clanking against another, but this works very well. And I'm having a blast with the color work, so tolerate me. And I think I've talked about the other projects right now. So I'm going to move on to Dizzy Blondes. Happy St. Distaff Day. I have a lovely meme that I found online with a little poem. If you're Catholic, you know there is no such saint as St. Distaff. It's a bit of a medieval joke that... On January 6th, you have one of the big holidays of the medieval church, the Epiphany. And on January 7th, everybody goes back to work. And of course, in the Middle Ages, when you don't have spinning wheels, it's a very labor-intensive thing to make fabric. And everybody in the family spins at some point in their life, from what I can tell, in at least Western Europe. And I believe that's still true in some of the high country of Peru with the indigenous peoples. Because if you're not going to have wheels and you're not going to spin more quickly, this stuff takes a lot of time. So on the 7th, everybody went back to their normal work, and that meant women began spinning a lot again on the 7th. And so the joke is it's a saint's day. It's saint's distaff, but no, there isn't a real one. It's a bit of a joke. By the way, those of you who've been mothers, particularly mothers of multiple children, I want to remind you that I'm pretty sure... During the 12 days of Christmas, the mothers of the family were still working really hard. They were possibly entertaining and hosting where they could afford it. But I'm pretty sure when you're raising a bunch of little kids in the Middle Ages, you got a pretty much full-time job there. They did have this sense of humor about it, that it was a special day when the mothers sat down to go back to work. And the men went back to the field, probably taking various of the children with them. And that may have something to do with why mom can suddenly get back to spinning. At any rate, you may remember that we had a big section called My Favorite Resources. And last episode, I told you, I switched that whole list over to a thread on the Ravelry group for the Cognitive Podcast. So if you go into the show notes, you will find a link to that thread. So you can find all the people who have supported us at CFR23 with the goodie bags. You will find My Favorite Dyers. You will find all sorts of nice Things that you can look at and buy. Goodies, yarn, extras, suppliers, LYSs, you name it. In the meantime, I realized I was carrying quite a few links that involved skills and techniques for knitting and crochet. And so I decided to give them their own thread on the Ravelry group too. So this shortens the show notes, which makes them easier for me to manage a little bit. It allows me to have a better view of my notes as I write them. So there they all are gathered, and if you want to see the skills and techniques that I've been talking about, or that I name, and you want to see also my favorite resources, there are links right there. The other thing is, when I come up with something new, I will put a link in the show notes, right in the episode where I talk about it. But if I've already talked about it, I will refer you to these links. Saves me from repeating stuff over and over. And it gives you a sort of clearinghouse where all this stuff can be found. So let's go on to the strategy. 
And the strategy is a lot of fun. This is thanks to our own Chris Ah, alias Cutiful Christina of Cutiful Yarns. Yes, those links are in that list of my favorite resources. But I was saying to her, when I saw her beautiful children in the family picture they sent me at Christmas, I was laughing and like every mother does, I thought, oh, they're so beautiful, they're so sweet, they're so innocent. Boy, I'll bet like all kids though, when they want to make you crazy, they can do it. And I was laughing about that. No harm intended. Every kid has their dark side, you know, whatever. Or their, their I should say their rowdy side. But I said something to her about, you know, this is only a phase. If they're making you crazy, remember it's a phase. And she said, boy, I really needed that. Yeah, and so I'm going to say it again as the strategy this week. I talk a lot about parenting and all that, but I think while we're talking about strategies for parenting, one of the really important ones is recognizing that your kids are going through developmental phases and that filters down to their behaviors. So you have a little kid and they suddenly discover that they can do things. You know, they're 11 months old and they begin to realize they can walk and they can even run and they discover, as my kid did, they can run out the front door if mommy's in the kitchen and she thinks the door is locked. Now, the interesting thing is the kid really is making a discovery. And so when my kid went out the front door, we had to put U-bolts on the doors well out of his reach. We found out he could climb the doors. He was quite resourceful, little booger. And so we had to do stuff to keep him from killing himself. And that's what it's like to have a toddler as you all know. And the thing is, it really is just a phase. And the reason it's a phase is, as kids get bigger, they begin to learn new things they can try. They're gonna try everything, just trust me. And your job is to try to be a step ahead of them. But they are trying something new. They're not born this way, they're not evil or crazy. They've just noticed they have a new ability and they're gonna try it out. And after a while, they're either gonna get used to the ability or they're going to realize this makes mommy really unhappy. And that is why in toddlerhood, you have this balance on the one hand of, I got to try all these new things. They are actually developmentally driven to try every new thing they can. They're exploring their world hard. But that is countered with, I really want to make mommy happy or their primary caregiver. And they do understand daddy as well. So they want to make mommy and daddy if they have both happy. And these things are important that they occur together because sometimes that desire to please you is the only thing that keeps your kid from basically doing something stupid to kill himself. He doesn't know why it's stupid. He doesn't know why he shouldn't grab that pretty blue flame on your gas burner, for example. He thinks it's pretty and he should grab it. That's what they do to explore. But he does know that mommy goes crazy when he does that and she gets very upset with him. And so that balance is what keeps the kid alive, that he realizes he'll please mommy. Eventually he grows up and mommy says to him, you know, when you were little, you used to try to grab that. And the kid will sort of blanch and go, oh my gosh, no, that's so dangerous. Yes, that's right. That's why wanting to please mommy is balanced in your development as human with wanting to explore everything, everywhere, all the time, nonstop. So you do have to say with your kids a lot, it's just a phase. And so when your kid performs a behavior that scares you, yes, that's real and you have to manage it, but your kid isn't going to do it eternally unless something is very, very wrong in your family. But let's take it from the mother of a 17 year old boy. Number one, yes, he still has phases. Even at 17, he's still discovering new things. But number two, if you're doing your job as a parent and you're working on a steady, consistent disciplinary system with positive reinforcement, your kid's going to be okay, and he's going to work on that thing about pleasing you. And my kid, they outgrow it. You know, when they're toddlers, they want it. It's a driving force. As they get older, social relationships begin to replace that, and their sense of rules begin to replace that. But if you're raising your kid with love and affection and tolerance and positive reinforcement and reasonable discipline, then your kid is going to continue to want to please you. So you do have to say over and over again, this is a phase. And I will tell you every now and then my husband and I will be talking and he'll say, you remember when our son did such and such and we both slap our foreheads and we say, oh, thank goodness, that was only a phase. 
And it is. Most of the really hard stuff, it's a phase. Please keep repeating that to yourself. And any other ideas you have or fantasies of just slapping your kid upside the head, remember, that's your phase. You'll outgrow it too, but you're not going to act on it. But the key phrase when you're raising a child is, this is just a phase. We're all going to get through it. The fluffy books. I haven't been watching TV. I tried to read the latest Riz Bowen book, Her Royal Spiness, and it's, it's not anything. I feel sad. That was a really good series when she started. But once the main characters marry, as they do in this kind of series, it just drops into, oh, look, another pair of rich people pretending they don't have enough money yet having this impossibly lavish life at a major country house. Yeah, okay. So I didn't put the link in because it's the, the latest Royal Spinus is no. I'd say the first few books in that series are a lot of fun when the characters are much more real and interesting, but it sort of gets old as time passes. So nothing good in the fluffy books. Something I really like, you have to look at the picture in the show notes to know what I'm talking about here. There is this adorable crocheted sweater, crocheted notice, going around the internet. And it is based on a pattern for the crochet cat afghan and the pattern is out of print. And I will give you more information on this as I get it. I can't remember the name of the woman who made the original. However, a nice lady named Viv Crochets, linked to her YouTube on this in the show notes. She used the application Stitch Fiddle, which is free. You go in, you tell it what you want to design and it'll help you generate a pattern. So Viv Crochets went in and she adapted the chart for the cat afghan and made it into a sweater and it's adorable. And I hope to make one of these because I really like this sweater. Now, everybody keeps doing it as a cropped sweater. I have no idea why. There's no reason you can't just do this as a longer sweater. And I fully plan to try. This is a sweater that is constructed in pieces. So you make a rectangle for an arm, a rectangle for the other arm, a rectangle for the back, a rectangle for the front. Now, the one I have a picture of is from Yarnspirations, which I think is the social media presence of one of the big commercial yarns. I think it might be Red Heart, but I'm not sure. Yarnspirations is worth following. I actually follow them on Instagram and I didn't used to, but they have put somebody good on this and they are posting really interesting things. This is not my first moment of liking a Yarnspirations post. They are using Peyton's yarn in that picture. They're using Canadiana, I think the yarn is called. I have no idea what that is if that's pure wool or a wool acrylic or what it is. What that is though is a darn cute sweater. Viv Crochets has a step-by-step -step tutorial, including if you don't know how to cro crochet, she's going to teach you. So she shows you the chart. Then she says, here is how you make a slip knot and on you go. So I am working on this because I have a good set of rectangle measurements from Crow Jennifer, I think her name is, who is the person I got my adorable wrapped in tiny chains cardigan pattern from. And that is just a lovely bunch of rectangles sewn together and it worked perfectly. If you look at the Yarnspirations picture, you will see that they have a yoke there. So they didn't quite do the rectangles just sewn together. It looks like they did a little more shaping. I don't care, I'll work it out. But I am really pleased with that sweater. There's also a great meme there that says, I never dreamed I would be a super sexy crochet lady, but here I am living the dream. I had to put that in there because it balances the pictures of that sweater. So the, the crocheted cat sweater based on the crochet cat afghan, I will be researching in the next few weeks. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to get myself some nice yarn and I like Peyton's yarn a lot. And so I'm thinking I may just go add to my stash right there. Or I may just dig through my stash because I do have some pretty nice yarns floating around. I could see that in an off-white background with cats that are beige and dark brown. And I was thinking of another, and I can't remember, yellow. Or a beige background, but messing with the brown tones for that. Uh, however, I do have a black cat, so I don't know. We'll see how that goes. But there are different variations of this all over the internet right now, and I really like it. And I don't tend to crochet sweaters because I like the hand better of knitted sweaters. 
but this one's going to lure me to the dark side. Also, by the way, I have to say to crochet an entire sweater takes me like a week. To knit an entire sweater takes me a month minimum. Okay, meanwhile, and put a lid on it. I'm giving you the recipe for Keterade again. I've given this to you before, but it's worth repeating because we are in cold flu, COVID and dehydration season. This does the same things for you that Gatorade or Pedialyte do. Gatorade has lots of chemicals that I wouldn't want you to drink. Pedialyte <laughs> is meant for small children and I believe does not have artificial stuff in it. However, this is the inexpensive, all natural version. I highly recommend it. The only thing important here, you do need a good quality apple cider vinegar that has the fermentation mother in it. I recommend Bragg's. You can see the spelling in the show notes. The other special thing you might have to get is new salt. If you're in another country, it could be called no salt. It is the same thing as table salt, except table salt is sodium chloride. No salt or new salt is potassium chloride. Potassium occurs in your body. Sodium you can ingest and it replaces potassium temporarily in your body. It's very good. It's not a harmful thing unless you overdo it. You really can't overdo potassium, I have to say, in your body's... You can, but it's very, very unusual to have high potassium. Okay, so the nice thing here, these are the electrolytes you find in Gatorade. The sodium, the potassium, and the chloride. Now for the sea salt, I use sea salt or I use pink Himalayan because you want a good high quality sodium chloride there. And the apple cider vinegar, again, you're using Bragg's if you're me. And then you use liquid stevia, take a few drops and half a lime or a lemon. Now, important thing to note, look how small these quantities are. Two tablespoons of the vinegar, half teaspoons of each salt, five drops of the stevia, half of a lime or a lemon. I don't actually use the citrus fruit I use a Trader Joe's sparkling water that's naturally flavored with citrus, but anyway. Okay, so these are very small amounts. So before you start thinking, well, that's expensive stuff. No, believe me, if you buy a bottle of cider vinegar and you buy sea salt, new salt, it's going to last you a long, long time. You want to put these in a glass jar, a one quart mason jar is what I use. Not plastic. These are acidic. We don't want plastic being eaten through and joining us in the drink. So I use glass. I have a lid that turns into a sippy cup on the top of my mason jar for this. Yeah, that's right. I drink it straight out of the jar because the boys don't drink it. In the meantime, so what are you going to do? There's very little there. Well, you put all the ingredients in your mason jar and then you fill it, the remainder, with your sparkling water. Like I said, I get a naturally citrus flavored one from Trader Joe's with no additives and no carbs or calories. And you use the sparkling water to fill the quart. You shake it up. And that's it. And I keep this in the fridge all the time now. You can use it after exercise. You can use it like I did when you have COVID and you're dehydrating. It is great stuff. The actual recipe is there in the show notes. In the meantime, I'm still working my way down the Plum Deluxe Advent Calendar. This is their herbal calendar. Day 10. I found this a little weak. Now I've ordered it to try again because there's an outside chance the first time I tasted this, I was losing my smell because of COVID. I'm not sure. And everything in it looks good. I mean, it's basically a mint tea. And I thought this seems good to me. So I did buy another ounce of Plum Deluxe, which arrived today. So I will let you know. But my original thought was this was a bit weak in flavor and fragrance. I thought it was faint, but it should be good. It's called Candy Cane Cookie Herbal. So I have it in the show notes and I would say it didn't register as one of my all time favorites, but it's, it's okay. And the biggest problem I had was even though I steeped it for a long time, it seemed very faint to me. Day number 11 was wonderful pomegranate decaf black, which was extremely accurately named. I never thought of myself liking a pomegranate tea. I'm not even sure what pomegranate flavor actually tastes like, although I have eaten pomegranates. But this one was unexpectedly good for me. It was fruity and very flavorful. The fragrance was okay without being sensational. Faintly berry scented to me. Again, I got to wonder how much sense of smell I had, but I really like this one, COVID or no COVID. I thought this was a winner. On to the blather. Okay. So first off was I have a bunch of house projects. The one I've been talking about a lot, and I'm still doing it, is I am cutting two and a half inch strips from my leftover fabrics from my skirts. 
and I'm using those just in future quilting projects. There's no dedicated project yet. What does that mean? It means if you're a quilter, you sort everything into dark and light, and then you make a log cabin quilt if you want to. That is one thing. Or you can make what's called a Roman stripe quilt. There's a lot of things you can do when you have strips. And if you have extra fabric that you want to use in a quilt, this is how you do it. I say this because at least two pairs of my pajama pants that have shrunk in a little too much for me and are made of flannel, they've been stripped as well. Because they're beautiful plaids and I thought that would be a lot of fun to put that in a quilt. So again, this is just something you do with your leftovers. Also, I want to point out, if you do this, and you, like me, have a group that we have in the Santa Clarita Valley, which is SCV Free Craft Supplies. And the only rule there is everything you just give away. Okay. You can take your leftover fabrics, make them into strips, and just give them away. Just say, here you go. And give them to somebody if you're not going to use them. I mean, in other words, you can circulate these things and you can trade them with your friends. This is a nice thing to have around the place. So I use two and a half inch strips because I think about a quarter inch seam allowance on each side. So I'm going for two inch strips when they're finished and sewn in. Now, of course, I made those six boxes up and gave them to givebackbox.com. Actually, I have two more to give, but I have these six boxes. And once you do this, oh my gosh, everywhere you look, you go, why didn't I put that in a box? So yes, I am still looking at weeding out various cabinets and shelves and donating them to givebackbox.com. As far as I know, these are still being accepted. If you go to the givebackbox.com website, you can print out a label. I don't know what they charge you for it, but you put the label in the box, take it to the post office, and they'll take it. Or you can drop it off at Kohl's stores. As far as I know, Kohl's are still accepting these donations. Now, if you go into Kohl's and you ask the people there, hey, are you guys still accepting these? They won't even know what you're talking about. So the real trick is go to givebackbox.com, go through the site, and you will see a button saying Kohl's will take your boxes for free. You're going to click on that. It's a link, and that will carry you through the process to donate to Kohl's. Kohl's does this as a very invisible charity, and I have to say I'm feeling very grateful to them for doing it. And then there's the candles. Every few years, I pour candles. Now, if you have never made candles, this is not rocket science. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I'll bore you. You can see a lot of the process in the pictures. I had worked last time I did this. I think it was, I said, the spring of 2018. And I worked in paraffin. Now, I don't like paraffin. I didn't know this at the time. It's a petroleum byproduct. So when you burn them, you're getting petroleum fumes in the air. We've demonstrated this in my house. Most commercial candles, including the big guys like Yankee Candles, are petroleum-based unless they tell you they're made of beeswax or soy. And even so, it better be 100%. If there's any petroleum, you're getting those fumes. Okay, so the first time I used petroleum-based paraffin, I got it at Michael's. It was very easy to work with. That's all nice. Used up those candles, gave them away as gifts. Found out from a friend who used to sell candles Hey, you got to use soy or beeswax. This time around, I had a 10 pound bag of soy chips that Twin Face had given me years ago as a Christmas present, which I love. And then just to hedge my bets, I was a little nervous about working in soy. So I also bought online a candle making kit. It came with way more than you needed. Three pounds of wax to make 12 little tiny tins, as you can see in that first picture at the top left. What I'm telling you is I had way more wax, way more fragrance, way more wicks than I needed. That's the way to do it. I wanted the limiting factor here on the number of candles I made to be the wax. So when you run out of wax, that's nice. You feel like you've done your best. Now, why am I making candles? The original impetus was we had a huge number of mugs all over our cabinets and they needed to go. They weren't particularly special. So that's what I did the first time. This time around, I did some extra mugs. The Knitmore girls donated three of their mugs to me, three or four, from one of their fundraisers a few years back. And I also had tins in the candle making kit. That was nice, 12 little tins. 
And I also had a lot of jars from my canning days. Now, because I'm diabetic, I don't can because there's too much sugar involved. And I thought, rather than give those jars to Goodwill, why don't I just put candles in them? Here is a tip for you. If you're going to pour candles, the one thing you do want to do is buy molds for votive candles. Why? Because if you want to use up your wax, your last bits and bobs of wax can go in those molds. Yes, you do take the candle out of the mold and you have a nice freestanding candle. And so I highly recommend if you're going to do this, one thing you should do is go get some votive molds. You can find them. Just look online for a candle supplier. There's quite a few out there. Okay, and you can see how I'm centering the wicks by twisting them around pencils. You can see a lot of what I'm doing. You can also see, if you're being clever, that I start with the solid dark containers so that if I mess things up, the wax is hidden by the mugs or the tins. So the viewer doesn't go, ooh, that wax came out gray. It only happened to one. One of the mugs, for some reason, looks gray-green. It just did not work out well. Soy is a little more challenging than paraffin to work with, but that doesn't mean much. It's still pretty easy. The only place you run into difficulty Paraffin freezes up fast when you put it at room temperature. Soy takes a bit longer to solidify. So if you want to pour your candles in layers of different colors, you have to kind of take your time and let the soy solidify. The other thing with soy that I don't remember with paraffin, when you add color, you heat the soy to a certain temperature, it's all melted, you let it hit the temperature, then you take it off the heat and you stir in your fragrance and you got to stir it for two minutes to get the fragrance distributed. Now the color, I started by saying this is about color, but it's actually about fragrance. The thing with the color is very easy. You just get a color chip. And they're very cheap and you know very very cheap things to buy. Just buy colors, chips of wax in the colors you want. They're super saturated and they one little chip will do a pound. So I added a lot of chips because I wanted some intense colors and I had a lot of fun. Mostly my colors were variations on red, pink, fuchsia, cranberry, and then I had some white, which I wanted to use up because really white chips, you know. and then I had some really nice sort of holly green. So I had a lot of fun, but the theme song here was smells like flowers, looks pretty red. This is easy to do. You need very little equipment. You need a dedicated pouring pitcher. You can see mine in the last picture, a big steel cylinder with a handle on it, nice insulated handle. And you need a dedicated wax thermometer. They make special types that clip onto the pitcher. And that's about it. Everything else in there is just stuff in my kitchen that I used and could recycle. Now the other thing I did, I took my old candles, which were soy, that I got from Frostbeard Studios, among others, and I had wax left in the bottom of them. So you know what I did. You can see it in the bottom picture. You're melting the wax in a double boiler arrangement. So I get a big flat saucepan, fill it with water, get it to a simmer, and leave it on a simmer. After that, you put your old jar of candles or tinned candles in there. Make sure you have insulated gloves or a nice set of tongs. Put it in there, let the wax melt. Pour it right into your wax pitcher, and that's that. And a nice clean container to use again. And I did scrape out the mount for the wick in the bottom of these and put in fresh ones. This is really easy to do. You can get a lot of these supplies at Michael's, but you aren't going to get soy chips last time I checked at Michael's. You do have to go online, and I would say the online stuff is better quality, and they know what they're doing. You're buying them from candle suppliers. It's not expensive to do, but it is a great way to upcycle old jars, old cans. You could probably even use cans from like canned food if you want. Old tins, old candles that came in jars or tins. This is a great way to keep things out of the landfill and it's very useful. The fragrances, I used essential oils. Some of them came in the candle making kit that I bought as a cheat. Why did I buy the candle making kit? I wanted a nice clear recipe for making soy candles. I found a bunch of confusing ones on Pinterest and I decided this was a better investment. I ended up with 36 candles. As far as I know, the smallest of these right now would cost you $8. So you do the math. You know, if you said each of these 36, what would that be, 254, something like that? Let me tell you. 
I did not spend $254 on these supplies. Okay, in other words, you're going to win. These are really nice gifts. These are hostess gifts. If you go to a party in the holidays, just hand one to your hostess. Happy Christmas or Happy New Year or Happy Hanukkah, whatever. These are just great to have around the house. I did not get fussy with the scents. I don't even know what scents I used. A lot of them were just flower-based. Because when you're using red wax, using the citrus-based ones seemed a little stupid. Okay, so you have to be real about that. I just poured candles all afternoon. So I would be able to pour until my one pound of melted wax ran out. And some of them I would just pour in levels and let it harden so I could have layered candles. Some of them I just poured straight in until I filled it. There's a lot of fun here, a lot of experimenting. Any idiot can do this. The first pour, I was really, really nervous, and every pour after that, I was like, nope, this is really, really easy to do. The soy was perfectly easy to work with. It's a little more finicky than the paraffin, but that isn't saying a lot. It was still pretty easy, and I highly recommend this for upcycling those old mugs around the house and for having fun. It is not an activity for the kids simply because you are working around some high temperatures, melted wax, etc., but it is fun to do. Your teenagers could do it with you as long as you help them be mindful about the process. No, nobody was injured. But there's a lot of pictures there of various stages of the process. So you can sort of see what the wicks look like, how I'm balancing them using pencils. You can see the different types of jars. You can see at the very last picture what it looks like on the stove when I'm melting leftover wax in one candle jar and assembling my goods. This is an easy thing and I do recommend you do this every few years. Meanwhile, I'm also still cutting apart our used up or outgrown t-shirts for making quilts. Now lately I've been finding baby tees from my son and we don't know what to do with them. So they just keep popping up in these weird random places in the house. And I thought, okay, look, I have to use these. Now what will probably happen to those tees? Well, there's not enough to make a whole quilt. So probably I will put some of those fabric strips on them as sashing to make them as big as the other t-shirts when I make my next t-shirt quilt. But I have to say, making a t-shirt quilt, when I do it, I'll tell you how I did it. I've done it before, and if you don't want to do it, there is a company, and I will give you the link in the show notes. I've already given it to you before, and it's Project Expat. And if you send them the t-shirts cut into pieces the way they tell you to, the way I'm doing it, where you cut the front apart from the back, they will make a t-shirt quilt for you. But if you don't want to give up those beautiful t-shirts that for me are trophies from my races that I ran that gave you shirts as a prize instead of a medal or whatever, if you don't want to give up those special shirts, or if you have a kid in college and they have all these shirts from their various organizations and sports and stuff, this is what you do with them. All you do, get yourself a nice Tupperware container, and take your shirt, cut the front apart from the back. That's all, leave the sleeves on, don't have to do anything fancy, just separate the front from the back. And that's your basis. When you get enough of them, you can make a throw or even a bed size quilt. So I'm still doing that. I suspect I will be for quite a while. Meanwhile, yes, I'm still working on our walkway in the front yard. I added a third panel of the cedar planking, but the ground is very hard. So it's hard for me to really hammer this baby in we're waiting for a little bit of rain and it looks like I'm going to need at least one more if not two more strips of the cedar planks. At this point I need to go out and measure it but that's not hard. And if I can find them I bought solar lights to put out next to it. So we're still working on that one. I haven't mounted my garage camera yet. So that's quite a few house projects isn't it? On the pup date, well there's a picture of the dog beds that I gave the boys for Christmas. The one in the front is the original Pluful dog bed, and then behind it is a knockoff. I'm lying in the Pluful. My son grabbed the picture, and Captain is lying in the knockoff bed. Captain was in the bed with me, but he didn't find it roomy enough to be comfortable, so he, he, she went to the back bed. But yes, we're both in dog bed. Somebody said, give that dog her bed back, and it's like, no, nope, she's got the knockoff. She's doing just fine. Both the dogs will not lie in them, if we're looking, which is very funny. Queenie likes to jump in and out of them. Captain occasionally will lie down in one if I'm lying down in the other. Over the vacation, Queenie had some solid practice at being in the house, but again, she gets a little hysterical sometimes, so we're working on it. Nothing else going there. All my usual projects are there. In the hub state, all I can say is the beloved son wanted Minerva 
to be able to roam the house freely. So he took down the Christmas tree really rapidly this year because Minerva kept eating the needles of our artificial tree. So the tree is gone. It's really quick. I have to be honest, usually I like to keep the tree around for a few months. I just do. Trees make me happy. But it's really nice to have my cat roaming around without eating dangerous things. And I haven't even begun to look at Project G again. The garage is looking a bit trashed. Nothing else on the projects. So that takes us on to the calendar. And of course, some of this is local to me in the Santa Clarita Valley, Yarnopoly and Second Saturday Stitchers. They both have Facebook groups. They meet up on the second Saturday of each month at different times. You can't even go to both if you want to. Both of them are largely crochet groups, which I find refreshing. Meanwhile, the Joanne Darcy Library in Canyon Country has the second and fourth Saturday of the month. They have three-hour meetups, sit and stitch. I think it's nine to noon. So if you want to do that, that's out there. I haven't put it in the show notes, though. CFR 10 will be at the Courtyard by Marriott in Valencia on September 28th, 2024. Yeah, I think the signups are going to open sometime in July. People who've already attended get first sign up. Romeo next year looks like December 21st to January 1st. I may not take all of that because Christmas is on a Wednesday, but we're just going to see how that goes, shan't we? And also, you may notice I've started collecting these memes about knitting. They all are about knitting right now. I don't have a crochet one yet, but it'll get there. These have to be visuals. I don't just want statements. But at any rate, you've got my blonde dragon there, and there's good old Gromit from Wallace and Gromit knitting, saying knitting makes everything better. And then there is a, I think that's a Beatrix Potter image of a little dormouse knitting. So there are the cozy memes, because I just want you to have some cozy memes that you can distribute around and cut and paste. So there they are. And that leads us down to Minerva, who gets the last word. And the last word is... Happy New Year, but you need to stop doing the human crazy. That is, this year, Minerva noticed that if you live in California, the New Year actually begins at 4 p.m. our time, because that's midnight Greenwich Mean Time. So Minerva points out that she thinks it's time to begin celebrating at 4 p.m., not sitting up till midnight. Then we should go to bed at a reasonable hour, which led me to say, hand me that champagne while I'm putting on my pajamas. And in the meantime, you can see a picture of Minerva and Captain, and they are not waiting up. They're both take that is on New Year's Eve, and they're both sound asleep. That was somewhere between 8 and 9 o'clock. So really, I found out that Minerva is on Greenwich Mean Time, and Captain, well, she just kind of slavishly does whatever Minerva does. So there you are. That's our lovely episode 164. And the title is Candlemas is Coming. Candlemas, by the way, is February 2nd. If you're Wiccan, that's in bulk as well. If you're American, it's Groundhog's Day. But in the old medieval church, it was candle mass. At least in Great Britain, it was. And so I made candles. So that's where that title's coming from. In the meantime, remember, we are a community. When we care for the community, we are caring for ourselves. So remember, everybody, it's time to stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the blog spot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.